So hello, good morning, um, and good afternoon to everyone wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for today's talk uh, with Joseli Carvalho. I hope I said that right. <laughs> we, we practiced mm -hmm. before. Yes. Um, we're so excited to have her here today uh, to discuss her work and her practice. Um, before we get started, I just have a couple quick announcements. Um, our Art Tables Artist Talk series is made possible through a generous grant from the Pollock Krasner Foundation. So we would like to thank them for their continued support of this program. My name is Haley Carloni and I'm Art Tables National Programs and Chapters Manager. I am a white woman and use she, her pronouns. I have very long brown hair, brown eyes, and am wearing a uh, black long sleeve top with yellow and orange flowers. Um, and I'm currently located in my living room in Brooklyn in front of a blank white wall. For anyone who is joining us with a hearing impairment, uh, we do have closed captioning available for this presentation. Um, if you just click closed captioning on the bottom of your Zoom screen, you can access that. I would like to note that Art Tables National Office is based in New York City, and we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are guests in this region, which is located on the ancestral homeland of the Munse Lenape people. We acknowledge that over 500 sovereign native nations with ties to the geographic borders of the United States and recognize that the Munsee Lenape people still call the island of Manahata home. Uh, so one last note about Zoom before we begin. Uh, we everyone should be muted. You should have been muted as you joined us and we request that you all just stay muted uh, throughout the duration of the conversation just to ensure there's no background noise or anything like that. Um, but we'd love to see you. Feel free to keep your video on and running um, on gallery view and say hello to everyone. Um, if you have a question during the conversation, just enter it into that chat field um, and we'll address as many as we can at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Um, and one last note is that this program is being recorded for our archives. Um, and if you wanna ensure that you're not shown, just keep your video off and that will not be a problem. So thank you for indulging me in my announcements. And once again, we're thrilled to have Josalie here with us and I will turn it over to her to get started. I would like to thank uh, the board and the staff of our table, uh, Julia Herzberg uh, from the New York Chapter Program Committee that uh, invited me to participate in this series. Uh, and Haley Carloni that has been wonderful organizing and helping me to understand the, the whole procedure. And of course, for Paula Krasner Foundation, not only for the support for this program that gives voice to women artists, but also because I have received a grant from them about two, three years ago, and uh, it was extremely crucial because it was in the moment of my life that uh, it really helped me to continue working. Uh, it was extremely important to me. Um, and of course, it's a privilege to be here with all of you. I'm so glad there are so many friends around. And, uh, and uh, the only thing I feel is that uh, we are not physically together. And uh, with this nine months of living in isolation and uh, and deprived of physical contact of friends and families. We are very thirsty to be together, to touch each other, um, to, to smell each other. Uh, like in the, in the north of Brazil, uh, people say when they say hello, they say a smell or say goodbye, a smell for you and uh, a share. And uh, uh, yes, we are missing this smell of each other. Um, now, uh, as the work, I mean, a woman for me has been the main character throughout my open diaries of uh, images and smells. And uh, although we have finally broken the glass ceiling with elected Vice President Kamala Harris, we also have seen during the pandemic an increase in domestic abuse, sending a red light to our work has not been completed. Uh, as Confucius said, uh, it does not matter how slowly you go, as long as you do not stop. Thank you. 
time and space, memory and history, body and embodiment, politica and the social moment, these are some of the shoes that weave to the netting of art making for me. The female body was the first map, the foundation of my practice. We smell because particles of it vaporize it. Airborne molecules enter our bodies and becomes for a moment part of us. The sense of smell detects them in a very intimate and primitive encounter with all the elements that make up the world. A smell memory of my childhood was my introduction to the world of smells in early 80s. But it was only in 2009 that I was able to create smells as protagonists together with visual and sound elements in my installations. When I was six years old, my grandmother said, go take a bath if you don't want it to smell of codfish. Of course, I didn't understand what she meant. But 30 years later, as a woman, I understood the repercussion of repression imposed upon women's genitals and sexual desire. Actually, it's still very common prejudice in many cultures. The smell of fish was present only in, as a memory in image, sound, and poetry. But at the openings, we served codfish cakes. A revival of this installation will be presented by Galeria Cavallo in Rio de Janeiro in October of 2021, if COVID allows us. Human relationship to others is a very complex and it's made up of many confusing myths, cultural taboos, lack of scientific knowledge, and above all, deeply rooted fear of the invisible. The smell for a long time has been understood as a, as a sense of madness and savagery. And the body was somewhat disconnected from it. Uh, Sigmund Bauman said that modernity has been a total war against smells. Perhaps now, with the neurofaction research, smells will be more inclusive in contemporary art. The olfactory tract transmits direct signals to the oldest areas of the human brain, the limbic system. It includes the amygdala that governs emotions and the hippocampus that acts as a memory indexer by sending them to the appropriate part of the brain for long-term storage, bypassing those parts of the brain responsible for language and cognition, according to Linda, ba Linda Bach, the Nobel Prize in 2004. And it's also the only sense that cannot be switched off. We smell all the time with every breath that we take 23,000 times a day. The brain scientist, uh, Johann Lundström, has written that a great deal of processing odor is done unconsciously. I could say that olfaction is an art of the in-between. It exists in the crevices. It intertwines present and past experiences. It establishes an interplay between oneself and the other. And yet it's unpredictable in how it affects each one of us. Its interactivity is emotional. I have seen during the installations and the openings of the, my installations, how people after smelling a little becomes uh, very open to conversations 
and they start talking with people that they don't know. And in a little while, they are sharing memories and they are sharing stories. So smell is a, is a social body. Yes, we are born with odor and taste preferences acquired from the amniotic fluid in the womb. Airborne molecules enter our bodies and becomes for a moment part of us. It can envelop ourselves in a haptic experience. Scientist uh, Jennifer Plusnik found that the olfactory receptors are found not only in the nose, but in other areas of the body, such as the kidneys, lungs, and the blood vessels. One of the first examples in her research confirmed that human sperm have, the, have olfactory receptors to sniff and swim towards the egg. In early 2000, I start an imaginary voyage of recognition of Brazil, my birth country, which I had left in 1964. It was a search for the smells of a forgotten nest of my growing up. It started with a photograph of a small bird that in the process of building his nest crashed toward its own image reflected on a glass window panel. A suicidal act? Or just a fragile act of construction of a nest? The series Nidus Vitrio, Glass Nest, became the representation of this basic need to be sheltered. In our moment in which the sense of home is threatened by wars, migration, instability, pandemic, and environmental collapse. The nest, the place where our first sense meets this primeval necessity of protection and shelter as the first place where we learn, according to Spinoza, to affect and to be affected by others. We are born alone. We build a protective shelter together in community with others. And yet, we think and die alone. But we smell throughout our life passage. That is an experience strongly associated with odors. As the physical body shuts off it starts the process of decomposing. The body inhales the last smell at the same time that exhales the last breath. Throughout history, the rites of death have been inseminated with an olfactory capacity. An interplay between life and death can be noticed by the molecules of putrescine and cadaverini they are partly responsible for the smell of rotting flesh that accompanies the decomposition of organic material. The same molecules are part of the characteristic odor of semen. In olfactory terms, death and conception are closely linked. Perhaps this vital continuity in death, putrefaction, rebirth, was perceived in rural cultures where the odor of ex excrement was welcome because of its fertilization quality. Nidus vitro was a large and yet very intimate construction of a thousand branches molded in the fragility of glass resin and built with the strength of avian architecture. It was then in 2009 that Givaudan do Brasil in Sao Paulo, a multinational company of flavors and fragrance started to support my smell making. I could not have done whatever I do today or have done in these last 10 years without their assistance. I was able to create the first smells, smell of nest placed inside of the 
nest inside of the sculpture and taken over the whole room. And the smells of the wet earth, open sea, and hot sun, the smells of collective shelter, our planet in danger of extinction. What could be the smell of nest for you? Should I give you a little time to think, to, to sense it, to smell? I mean, no, I cannot give you smells, that's a pity, but uh, you can have it in your imagination. Um, because of the reduced olfaction vocabulary, we need to use metaphors and associations to create and describe it. it. Since others are related to individual experiences, each person will perceive a smell differently and have different reactions. For me, the smell of nest at that time was a mixture of sour breast milk, dirty diapers, fresh skin of a newborn baby, wet branches, broken twigs, sweet flying feathers, leaves, disinfectants, bacteria, mold, wet soil, it was how I started my communication process with the technician from Givaudin. I'm not interested in creating perfumes, but smells. And this presented a challenge for me working with perfumists that are trained to create a pleasant smell. From this working, exchange, I learned that bringing a hint of a pleasing fragrance, it may reinforce the repulsiveness of some smells. Actually, to taste or smell something delicious, you needed to have experienced something disgustful. Birds eventually leave their nests. One year later, the glass nest was abandoned and became shards of memories. Very early one morning, I was arranging my collection of broken goblets in the old black marble fireplace, right underneath my self-portrait, upside down. And I caught a whiff of breast sour milk Older, in a shard of one of the broken glasses. It was the beginning of shards, an olfactory artist's book, photographs and installations from 2011 ongoing. Probably all the chapters and series of my diaries are open, are ongoing, and they only will be closed with my last smell. One after another, the wine glasses broke, while I collected the pieces without questioning the reason. But now I question why I hoard glass slivers? Why saving the cutting sharpness of shards? Could it be the need to have at hand a weapon to puncture or dig into the arteries? to have a penetrated instrument whose future function could be to make a wrinkled skin bleed into death? Or would the shards be just a shelter for individual and collective memories? I'm passionate about glass. Its transparency, its fragility, its 100% recycling quality, its reflection, strength, when cracked and shattered, the representation of danger. The glass shards, the visual memory of glass and sound and 13 smells materialize it in the exhibit Glass Ceiling, shown in 2018 at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sao Paulo. Why I hoard glass slivers? Para mim, a obra de arte é isso, é o caco que aconteceu por acaso. 
Eu acho que esse momento é uma obra de arte. The wine glasses broke, and I collected the pieces without questioning why. But their shards hold silent confidences. Existia um cheiro nesses cacos que parecia que era um cheiro de leite materno azedo. Joseli Carvalho é uma mulher forte e, sobretudo, uma artista engajada com o tempo e com as questões do tempo que ela vive. O que vai ser mostrado agora tem todas essas camadas de questões sociopolíticas, as questões pessoais da artista, as questões do feminino e essa questão do olfato, que é um sentido ainda pouco trabalhado. A concepção e a formulação desse cheiro passa pela subjetividade, que é a Joseli, e aí perceber essa obra de um outro jeito que é com mais sentido. Toque, se aproxime, faça parte e quebre com essa santificação do museu. The transparent glass earns a shattered in metaphors the power of dissent. Today, the shards are a conquest. Emanates an intense, sensuous, narcotic smell of the Dama da Noite. Cheiro do afeto, da cheiro, cheiro de brigadeiro, cheiro, de cheiro da bactéria, cheiro, da cheiro, da barricada, cheiro de gardenha, cheiro, da morte. cheiro do vazio. Nós nos livramos dos nossos cacos. O artista encontra no caco a poesia da memória e consegue trazer isso para nós. Parte da nossa vida é viver dentro desses limites. O cheiro não tem limite, o cheiro invade. Archiving the odors of resilience in the blown glass nest is my delirium. The smell of shards was encapsulated in the transparent uh, silk curtain. And uh, the public, to be able to go from one room to the other, had to go through this curtain. And the moment they would go through the curtain, the smell of broken glass, the smell of shards, would almost like invade them. And the encapsulation, uh, was done in two different ways. One, as you pass, you would sense it uh, a little of the smell. But if you touch it and if you twist it, the cloth, as you go through, the smell would be much, much stronger. And uh, it was a smell of broken glasses, of uh, shattering, of uh, containing nitriles and natural galbano, metallic uh, aldehydes that uh, were able to provoke a state of alertness. The, this encapsulation uh, was done with uh, Anansi, uh, a, uh, a company uh, in Sao Paulo that uh, um, has been supporting me too in my work, and uh, they are a pioneer in the use of nanotechnology. Nanoencapsulation uh, retains the smell, while the liquid form volatilizes very fast. And that's the reason I am interested in finding different ways of doing the nanoencapsulation. Crossing the curtain, and sensing the shard smell, the visitor enters in the second space and encounters his or her own reflection in the glass sculpture created from a shattered door, retrieved from the 2013 protests that I participated in Rio de Janeiro. Um, this sculpture I call Marielle Franco, that was its title. When I had the opening at the museum, I had, uh, I didn't have a title. I had an untitled for the sculpture. A few days later, um, 
Marielle Franco, a black Brazilian politician and activist, was murdered by militia. And uh, I understood at that moment that I had done this sculpture for her because as she was murdered at gun uh, to her car and it went through the glass window of her car. So uh, up to today, the government has not prosecuted the killers. I entered the world of glass blowing to create a nest vessels for smells. It was metaphorically a reconstruction of glass shards through the act of breathing. Glass and smells have been partners throughout history. Glass ceiling was composed of six smells that created resilience. They were pepper for pepper spray, lacrime for the smell of tear gas, anoxia for the smell of bacteria, barricade made up of burning tires as a protection from the police, dust from the crumbling buildings, and uh, the queen of the night that was at the center of the space. And uh, this flower is a very tiny white night flower, almost invisible, but with an intoxicating smell representing in this installation for me, the female sensibility as an alternative. Because of COVID, the exhibit within Smells of History was postponed for the end of 2021, hopefully. Um, very little research has been done on the role of olfaction in wars and wars. Although we can imagine from some moments, uh, there is a, a something in the film uh, Apocalypse Now, when a lieutenant awakes up in the morning and say how much he loves the smell of napalm bomb. Also, when I was in Germany, in Berlin, at the Museum of Stasi, the secret police of East German, um, I found a collection of few, gla a few glass jars. Um, they, they have uh, filled these glasses with a, a yellow cloth that had been soaked in the smell of possible dissident, dissidents. Under suspicious, the cloth would be given to train dogs to find its owner. And I believe that there are many other cases between smell and war. But I didn't find any specific historic research on the role of smells in Brazil's early colonial years. And because I'm not a historian, I allow myself a poetic license to bring a, an unauthorized history of Brazil. I connect the history of these military cannons and the places where they were stationed since at the time Portugal, France, England, Netherlands entered Brazil to the present political moment. As we know, Colonialism is still present in our ideas of power, race, class, culture, gender, sexuality. As an example, uh, one of the canons talks about uh, the genocide of indigenous communities since Europeans arrived in Brazil. And it still continues today in the middle of the pandemic when a president disregards indigenous cultures, their land and identities, allowing space in the law for landowners to invade and burn their land. The site-specific installation is made up of 40 military cannons from the collection of the museum. By January, I had created 20 smells 
with the collaboration of the perfumist Leandro Petit from Givaudan. By March, I lost my sense of smell for about two weeks. My body had been invaded by an invisible creature, COVID-19, provoking fear of anoxia and fear of death. I already had made these smells before. In April, we postponed the exhibit, but anxiety and fear continued throughout the pandemic and they can be felt through the sweat, creating a chain reaction in many cases, like as an example with the, the uh, ants, the, when they suffer an attack in their nests, they produce pheromones in alarm, waking a defensive reaction within the colony. To create the salty smell of fear, we added scatol and indol to bring forth the smell of urine, sweat, and feces that accompany many moments of panic. The way that uh, the public will sense the smells will be to place the nose almost inside of the canal, embrace the canal and put the nose. Um, could it be a meditation on war as they smell? As you know, and I have said already, the female has been throughout my artwork in the center. Um, and the male figure inhabit its borders. But this installation is about masculinity in the center. Today, the glamorization of firearms is increasing the desire for these objects of power that represent masculinity. Patriarchal supremacy still leads to sexual harassment, rape, and femicide in Brazil and many other parts of the world. These lingers, large penis, have been seen as symbols of military, economic, and sexual power throughout history. How could the female sensibility have a place in this garden of power? This was a question that took me a while to be able to answer. As a woman, I penetrated metaphorically this large time tunnel cannons, phallus, in search of past history and smells forgotten in the rusted iron walls. I found the smells of fear, invasion, delirium, affect you, absence, persistence, illusion, ocean, rainforest, incense, anoxia, death. As we were stricken by the pandemic, I saw the canons as a macro metaphor for the micro COVID-19 invasion. Yesterday, the cannon sent heavy, noisy, smelly, deadly iron balls, destroying bodies and shelters in the process of invasion and colonization. With the coronavirus, today invade silently our bodies, stealing our sense of smell and taste. And in fear, we feel the loss of touch, affection, and even life. Beginning from the assumption that each person has their own smell when dying, we first ask what could be the smells of death in history. Research from the University of Huddersfield in England raises the possibility that each body after death develops a unique odor. This odor of death comes from the liberation of different chemical substances. 
It could then be said that the body leaves a kind of olfactory digital impression. The body right after death exhales exanol, and as the time passes, a smell similar to nail polish begins to emit from the decaying body. Inside the oldest canon mouth of the museum's collection, I found the smell of affection. Conversing with the museum's historians, I felt their affection for the beauty and preciousness of this collection. I measured a pleasant fragrance with sweet notes of coumarin, maltol, amber, smell that reproduced family childhood moments of burnt sugar, condensed milk, and balsamic notes. Could the soldiers, in fear of death, behind their cannons, fantasize with moments of child's joy? Affection and an intense smell of caramel from grandma's cakes? It became a smell that provokes an appetite for life. This mortar was made in an emergency in Rio Grande do Sul, a southern state of Brazil, to be utilized in the revolution or coup of 1930. It was made of a sewage iron tube. The movement was led by Getulio Vargas, a very ambiguous figure who, despite maintaining the country for about 15 years under authoritarian and dictatorial regime, created also labor and populist policies. As an example, in 1932, the women's right to vote was declared as well as the introduction of women in politics. In 1934, the doctor and feminist Carlota Pereira de Queiroz became the first Brazilian Congresswoman. And yet, in the last three, four years, the president, the first and only women president, Dilma Rousseff, was impeached in a coup. And women are still struggling to be part of the political process. I recall my love for this tree, which is um, native of Brazil. Um, it's called Curupita Guianensis, and in English, cannonball tree. Uh, it smells have not been much explored in perfumery. The tree grows very beautiful flowers, aromatic, spicy, um, next to the fruits that have a size and weight of a cannonball. They both grow together from the trunk of the tree. In contrast to the aromatic and sensuous flowers, the fruit, when falls into the floor, erupts and disperses a foul, fatty, sulfuric smell, like that of decomposing. Givaudin, do Brasil, uses scent track, a patent form of smell extraction without destroying the flora. Well, we got the fruit in Rio de Janeiro, took a plane, went to Sao Paulo, to their laboratories, and they were able to extract its essential oil, since they did not have in their library of smells. With the combination of the flower perfume and the foul fruit odor, we created a female male scent as a metaphor for within the smells of history installation. We started talking with a memory of a smell. We travel through personal and collective shards. 
enter into the Garden of Canons with its massive death machines and foul odors. But I would like to end with the smell of the Queen of the Night in affection, an installation I show last year at the museum, uh, Museu Nacional de Belas Artes in Rio de Janeiro. Aquele cheiro que arde, ele vai arder, sempre. Aquele cheiro que sufoca, vai sempre sufocar. Se eu fosse fazer um cheiro para esse quadro, seria o cheiro do medo aqui. É o cheiro do suor. Em algum lugar, ainda que seja nessa fina teia da percepção, esses cheiros eles carregam ideias, eles carregam conceitos. O que, que é esse cheiro para você? A Jazeli, ela participou até pouco tempo da Radical Women, que é uma exposição de artistas ativistas da década de 80. Ela trabalha intensamente em um diálogo político com a realidade. O Museu Nacional de Belas Artes se tornou uma casa. O primeiro cheiro, que foi o cheiro do ninho, eu fiz aqui no museu. E agora estou voltando dez anos depois. Aqui é muito bonito porque diz, há lágrimas nas coisas e tocam a alma dos mortais. Vai ser uma exposição que as pessoas vão poder dialogar muito, compartilhar esses sentimentos, sensações, memórias e que vai provocar muitas pessoas a pensar e a terem uma experiência, né? sair daqui diferente do que quando entrou. Aqui é a Maria Ali Franco, que fica exatamente na parte principal e em frente a Avenida Rio Branco, vendo o que foram as passeatas até pouco tempo atrás. A obra Marielle Franco dialoga com o nosso maior item do acervo, que é o prédio do museu. A própria obra é o olfato, né? que é um sentido muito pouco discutido na arte contemporânea. A beleza da arte contemporânea é a gente aprender a ler com os nossos outros sentidos. A gente quer falar do corpo todo, como né, um receptor estético. Cada obra da Joseli foi pensada para se relacionar com alguma outra específica. Então, quando a gente coloca essas obras da Joseli junto com obras antigas, a gente faz uma relação e vê que, na realidade, as obras falam sobre questões humanas. Esses cheiros, eles estão baseados nas manifestações e nos protestos. Então aqui começa com o gás lacrimogênio. Os bandeirantes do Bernadelli foi escolhida pelo significado onde o indígena aparece amarrado dentro dessa floresta. O cheiro, ele vem tanto do gás lacrimogênio como também de uma lágrima. Ela permeia os nossos sofrimentos, as nossas dores, com cheiros que marcam. Os cheiros tomaram outras discussões. Ficou mais perigoso com essa ideia do infiltrar o museu, como protesto. Então, numa certa maneira, eu também me sinto um cheiro. Depois dos cheiros pesados, você encontra a Dama da Noite ali como uma espécie de dica, talvez. E é isso que eu acho interessante, porque não afirma nada. Ela provoca perguntas. Entrar em contato com a obra do Joseli é a possibilidade de nos descobrirmos como uma potência. A Dama está sozinha. Ela encontrou seu canto solitário. Todo cheiro é uma meditação. 